I'm David Petorti, and I wanted to read an unpublished op-ed, which I wrote on March 24th, 2004. And I don't know that I submitted it somewhere or not, or whether I submitted it and it didn't get run, but for some reason this never got published, so I wanted to read it today. And it's called Owning September 11th. Who owns September 11th? Some apologize for it. Others treat it like a hot potato. Some think the families have a moral authority. Others claim that it's a day owned by all Americans. As President Bush was warned by Colin Powell about Iraq, with ownership comes responsibility. Some accept both, others want neither. In the memorable words of a 9-11 widow on the topic of whether she owns September 11th, you're welcome to it, can I have my husband back? As the co-founder of Peaceful Tomorrows, a 9-11 group challenging the notion that embracing endless war is an appropriate reaction to the taking of our loved ones' lives, I've been witness to an evolution of public sentiment about 9-11 families. When we launched our group in February 2002, we frequently heard from those who took heart in our ability to turn our energies in a positive direction. We spoke in a lot of churches and for a lot of peace groups, and if the occasional cranks thought we represented the downfall of Western civilization, they confined their expletives to emails that were never signed. On the first anniversary of 9-11, when we were still wondering how kids would deal with the trauma, the National Education Association linked to our website as a resource for teachers. We were honored at an interfaith ceremony marking the opening of the UN General Assembly. We held a press conference in Washington, D.C., expressing our opposition to the use of September 11th as a reason for invading Iraq and sent a letter to President Bush. Condoleezza Rice wrote back. When we sent delegations to Afghanistan and Iraq, meeting our civilian counterparts who had suffered not only under the Taliban and, and Hussein, but also under U.S. sanctions and bombing campaigns, we were accused of being naive, expecting to end terrorism by singing Kumbaya with Osama bin Laden. We thought the image of 9-11 family members in Baghdad with a sign reading Peaceful Tomorrows for All in Arabic was a better expression of American values than the now ubiquitous images of burning buildings and school buses seen daily on Arabic TV. In 2003, we were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. That fall, we declared the World Trade Center site a politics-free zone and walked from New York's Union Square Park to Ground Zero with 8,000 people who had agreed to leave their signs and slogans at home in order to focus on remembering the dead. This March, when we asked President Bush to stop using 9-11 footage in his campaign ads, the realities of election year politics resulted in a disproportionate response from the worldwide media introducing us for the first time to a good number of their readers. Deciding that we had been created only a few hours earlier and ignoring our bipartisan call for all candidates to refrain from using 9-11 images, some chose to falsely recast us as that worst of all sinners, people using their victim status for political purposes. May this organization someday be seen for what it really is, servants of the Democratic Party, wrote S. Gherkin in an email, and may you end up in hell for what you have been caught at. God bless to the rest of us. That was an email we had received. Comments made to the press about the subsequent 9-11 commission hearings, which were happening solely because family members of the victims demanded them, only sealed our fate with the public newly aware of our existence and our advocacy. Some expressed a desire to get their money back, having donated to 9-11 charities with the expectation that all recipients would concur with their views. We don't receive money from 9-11 charities, by the way. Some accused us of claiming to represent all 9-11 families, we don't, while others attributed words spoken by other 9-11 families to be our own, they weren't. Others grew tired of hearing about us and thought it was time to shut up and get on with your lives. Shut up and go to hell, we want our money back. It was a short honeymoon for family members of the September 11th victims whose newspaper portraits embodied our grief, our critics having decided just as we began to scratch the surface of our actual feelings about what happened to us and to our country on 9-11, that introspection of the sort we traffic in is a bit more than the traffic can bear. But with more than 700 troops dead and 12,000 injured on the alleged battlefield of freedom, one might hope for a little less battle fatigue on the part of the public concerning the actual mission of our organization, promoting a U.S. foreign policy that places a priority on principles of human rights, creating a space for discussing alternatives to war, calling attention to threats to civil liberties and other freedoms at home as a consequence of war, and acknowledging our common experience with others affected by terrorism and violence around the world. But if I've learned anything in the past two and a half years, it's the extent to which people will go to avoid question, questioning their beliefs or challenging their preconceptions. 
Some can't imagine victims who choose to deny victimhood, transcend geography to find commonality, or take charge of their newly tragic lives to break the cycle of violence. Confronted by a reality they don't want to face, our critics invent a new reality. It's all about politics. We were coached by the Democrats. As a noted syndicated radio host claimed, we're not even 9-11 family members. That was Rush Limbaugh. Can I have my brother back? But facing reality was never a choice for us. And one of the realities I have to face as I deal with the emotional fallout of my brother's murder, and it continues to exert uh, an effect on my parents, my second brother, my sister-in-law, my wife, and my own children, is that the peace we seek can only come from listening to things that we may not want to hear and seeing things that we may not want to see. We drew our name from a Martin Luther King Jr. quote delivered in 1967 in reference to the Vietnam War. The past is prophetic and that it asserts loudly that wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. One day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. How much longer must we play at deadly war games before we heed the plaintive pleas of the unnumbered dead and maimed of past wars? On September 11th, the plaintive pleas we heard were the voices of our own families. In our work since then, we've met with others who have heard the same voices, survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who have devoted their lives to speaking out against nuclear weapons, parents of murdered Israelis and Palestinians who have turned their losses into a call for reconciliation between their peoples, South Koreans who work toward a peaceful reunification with the North, Rwandans who lost their entire families to genocide and have focused on peacefully rebuilding their society, people from Northern Ireland to Oklahoma City who have found peace by their willingness to face the anger that took their loved ones' lives. We've met their delegations, visited their homes, spoken at their ceremonies, offered them statements of solidarity and support. These links, symbolic, personal, professional, are a source of genuine power, actual healing, and real hope, both for us and for them. Terrorism destroys many things, not the least of which are the connections we share as human beings. We undo the work of terrorists by our willingness to remake those connections. This has been the work of September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows, and it, and it has grown out of the experience of taking ownership of the attacks that took our loved ones' lives. The most appropriate question the rest of us might ask is not who owns 9-11, but what we're going to do with our piece of it. <laughs>